Okay, well, thanks for the invitation, and thank you all for doing this. Um, yeah, this is about the future of journalism, right? Or video yeah. journalism or television. So let me give you some of my background to understand where I come from, and then I'll tell you the stuff we're doing, which I hope you'll find interesting. Um, many years ago, many years ago, I sat where you were, not here, but at Columbia Journalism School. And when I graduated, I got a job working at Channel 13, in the public television realm, actually out of Newark, New Jersey, producing the most unwatchable, you're from Newark? Yeah. The most unwatchable <laughs> show in the world called Mainstream, which was on at like 6.30 in the morning on Saturdays. Even my mother would not get up to watch it. <laughs> it was actually two people in swivel chairs with a flag and a palm tree and the mayor of some township. It was an awful, unwatchable program. But the great thing was that since we we're in Newark, they left us alone. So we started to produce what was called mini docs. And in those days, you went out with a cameraman, a sound man, a producer, and I think we won about 11 Emmys in three or four years, because they, just because they didn't bother us. And so I got hired by CBS Sunday Morning, which actually is still on the air. Probably none of you watch this, but it's a very popular <laughs> show, nonetheless. Anyway, I worked for CBS News for two years as a producer, and then I quit because I thought the whole thing was bullshit. So, pardon me. So, uh, <laughs> it was uh, because you went out with this report, with this correspondent who got paid a lot of money, did next to nothing. The producer did almost all the work. And then when we, we actually won an Emmy, and when we won the Emmy, we went to the award ceremony, and this guy, this very famous correspondent, do you see them still on the air, these 60 Minutes guys who do next to nothing? Anyway, this very famous guy stood up at the award ceremony and said, I want to thank all the people who worked on this. I found the story, I wrote the script, I did the interviews, I did the shoots, so I thought, screw you, I'm not doing this. So I quit, and which was a crazy thing to do, because I was like, you know, I was 30 years old, I was making $100,000 a year, which was a lot of money in 1988, and uh, I was a producer at a network and a big show, and everybody thought I was out of my mind. And so what I did was I went and bought a little home video camera. Today, everybody's got video cameras. In those days, nobody had them. And in those days, VHS, your grandparents probably had these things. And uh, so I bought something that was called Hi8, which was the new cutting edge technology just taken off. And I got on a plane, I thought, screw it. I can do it with myself. I don't need the network, which is probably a psychotic thing to do in some ways. <laughs> And so I went to live in a Palestinian refugee camp in the Gaza Strip, a camp called Jabalia. And I moved in with a family for a month. And it was during the first intifada. And so because I was living with the family, and in the meantime, all the news crews were coming in with the Israeli army, very protected, and doing these stand-ups. And I was there for a month. So they finally, I, you know, my name is Rosenblum. So in the beginning, they weren't so sure. But after a couple of weeks, they got to trust me. And then they would go, oh, come, Mike, we're going. So I met all the people, and I got great footage. <laughs> And then I came back and I went to Channel 13 for the news hour, which is still on the air, and I still recognize names in the credits. And I sold two pieces to um, McNeil Air News Hour, $50,000, which I thought was fantastic for like one month's work. It certainly beat working. And you know, from their perspective, it was cheap because I had, you know, if they had cameraman, soundman, producer, all these people, it would have cost them, and they weren't doing it anyway. So um, I thought, well, this is kind of fun. So then I went to um, Cambodia, where the Civil War was going on. And I was able to hang out with the Khmer Rouge, because you just by yourself. Man, eh, not so terrible. I mean, they weren't nice, but they weren't so terrible. And so then I shot that, and I sold that. And then I went to Afghanistan, where the Russians invaded. I went to all these bang-bang zones. And I was selling all my stuff. And I thought, oh, this is kind of fun. I'm having a good time. And then um, I got introduced to this Swedish billionaire. Did you ever read The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo? Yeah. So in the book, not the movie, but in the book, um, there's a, one person named Stenbeck, and he's the only real person in the book. His name was Jan Stenbeck, and he's a Swedish billionaire. And he, the reason he's in the book is because the guy who wrote it, Stieg Larsson, worked for him at one of his magazines. So this guy Stenbeck found me, and he flew me to Stockholm, and he understood the economics of what I had done. I had gotten rid of the cameraman, the sound man, the producer. I got rid of everybody, and the stuff still looked pretty good. So he asked me this seminal question that changed my life. He said, can you teach other people to do this? And I said, which I say to this day, any moron can do this. It's absolutely true. Any idiot can make television. So um, I went back to Brooklyn. I was living in those days. Brooklyn was not what it is today. I was paying $600 for a two-bedroom walk-up in Cobble Hill, which was kind of said, a very sketchy neighborhood. And so um, uh, I got a call from his lawyer after about a month. He said, Mr. Stenbeck wants to form a company with you. I went, great. He said, he'll put up a million dollars, which was a lot of money in those days, and give you 30% equity. I'm, great. And then I had, but the problem was I had to live in Stockholm. So I flew to Stockholm, and I spent two years building television stations based on this model. We get 30 people just like you. You would have been perfect models. And we take them, we gave each of them a video camera, and we taught them to shoot and edit in this very, very circumscribed way that I still do, very simple. And then we put them on the street, and that was a TV station. So we got rid of the studio and all the other crap that went along with it, 
And we put 30 people on the street every day with cameras. Well, WCBS to this day only puts eight camera crews on the streets of New York, which to me is insane, since they have about 250 employees. It's a stupid way to run a network. It's just idiotic, because it limits the number of stories you can do, and it makes everything very nervous, and they do a fire and a murder and an accident, and then the sports equipment, they call it a day. So the stuff sucks. So what we have is actually quite good. So I built these stations all over Sweden and Norway and Denmark, and then I got a call from Time Warner, and they said, we're going to build a 24-hour news channel in New York. Can you come down and design it first? I said, sure. So that was New York One, which is still actually on the air, which is the first station I did. And then I did one in called London called Channel One. I did one. So I started to build these things all over the world. They're very cost-effective. To make a long story short, I raised some more money on Wall Street, and I went and I hired a whole bunch of photographers who had just been fired from Life Magazine, which went out of business. And I gave them video cameras, and I formed another company. And then I sold that one to the New York Times, which became New York Times Television, which I became the president of, but I'm not cut out for corporate life. And then we built that into the largest nonfiction production company on the East Coast in about two years, only because we had such talented people unleashed, and we'd say, there's a camera, there's a door, go make stuff. No producers, no directors, no DPs, none of this crap that destroys creativity, just you and your camera. Some people could do it, some people couldn't, but a lot of these photographers, they have fantastic eyes. So in the first, we did this series called Trauma Life in the ER, which was all about real life. It's actually still on television. And so the first year, we won the National Emmy for news and documentaries, our little tiny company. And so I thought, oh, this works pretty well. So the thing's gone through a million iterations. I opened a bar, a video bar and cafe on Bowery, across the street from CBGB. And I lost a lot of money, but I was giving out cameras. But I'm a great believer in this democratization of video and democratization of the medium. The I took a video class there. Like, oh, you did? Yeah. I didn't know that. Did you pay? I did. Good. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's one of the reasons. So anyway, yeah, I mean, so I had a lot of fun. I lost a lot of money, but I, I give out cameras. I was getting, in those days, people didn't have phones. They didn't have cameras. So we gave out cameras all the time, and I had these things. We do these screenings, and I mean, it was a fun thing to do. One day, um, some guy, this big guy, Jamie Daves, walks into the place, and he's, I mean, I'm little, but he was huge. And so he says, let me talk to you about what you're doing. So I started this whole democratization and Gutenberg printing press and all these stories I used to tell. And then he left. And then the next day he called me up and he said, I represent former Vice President Al Gore. I said, well, that's nice. Gore had just lost the election. So he said, the Vice President would like to meet with you. I went, okay. So I lived in a loft in Soho. Then I said, tell him to come to my loft. So the next day, you get this, and the thing rings, and there's my little video screen, and there's Al Gore on my thing going. So he came with the other pen protector and yellow legal pads, and he came up to the loft, and we sat down. I gave him lots of bagels, which I don't think he knew what it was. And so, um, and then, uh, you know, he said, I'm going to start a new TV channel. I said, you are? He said, yeah, it's going to be history or politics. I said, no, no, man, don't do that. There's this revolution going on. Everybody's starting to shoot their own stuff. It's around the year 2000, 2001, and that's what it should be. So he flew me out to um, uh, Utah with his business partner, Joel Hyatt, and Joel's wife, and Tipper was there. And I brought cameras for them, and we ran around Utah <laughs> shooting video, and I showed him how to shoot and cut, and I said, you see, Al, any idiot can do this, even you. So <laughs> he said, I get it. So we formed this channel called Current TV, which you may have heard of, which was the first channel to invite people to contribute their own stuff instead of you know this nonsense of, I'm the executive producer, and here's what we're gonna do. This is bullshit to me, that they tell you what to watch. So that's, you know, this thing has gone through a million iterations, and now, of course, the great revolution that we're in the midst of now is smartphones and iPhones. See, with live streaming, there was a time when to go live would have cost, I need mean, a satellite, and now all I have to do is just get on the thing and start talking like this, which is absolutely astonishing, and theoretically, you know, millions of people can see this thing. But the great revolution is you all have smartphones, right? Everybody, nobody does not have a smartphone, right? Those smartphones, well, I mean, this is the 10, which is fantastic, but, oh, yeah. But if you, if you, um, if you, most, if you have from the iPhone 6 onward, you're shooting 4K, which is positively broadcast quality. And you can edit in the phone. And it adds music, and it adds graphics, and you share, and you can live stream. This is a revolution, because now, up until now, Places like CBS and NBC and ABC have had a monopoly, and uh, Fox, have had a monopoly on what you, the generic public, get to see, which is to me crap. Because they decide what you get to see. There's a million things going on in the world, and you only get to see 0.0001% of it. 
and they decide what the world gets to see, and they decide what the world's agenda is, because up until now, they have been the gatekeepers, because they control the technology. Up until now, if you wanted to make television, the cameras cost $80,000, they wait a ton. You still see these morons walking around these things on their shoulders, which is absolutely crazy. But this phone does anything that those, it does much more, in fact, and every single person has got one, which means the control of media, the control of news, the control of journalism has passed from the hands of ABC and CNN and Mr. Murdoch and has passed to everyone's hands. This is a real, real, real revolution. But it's only a revolution if people grasp the technology and take control of the medium from these people. Now, probably, you are all thinking, oh, if I get out of here and I'm really good, I'll get a job with CNN, wouldn't that be great? This is bullshit. Do not do that. Do not go there. Do not go and work for the, the plantation owner, the slave master. It's crazy. It's crazy because you can own and control the medium and you can make your own content. This afternoon at 6 o'clock, I'm giving a talk downstairs, right? Uh, how to make money with this thing. And trust me, you can make millions, yeah, you should come. You can make millions of dollars with this thing, but I'm not giving you the secret now, you have to come downstairs. <laughs> you know, I've got 17 people inside up, it's very disappointing, but you do it anyway. But the fact is that this sucker makes broadcast quality content every single time. So what we've done, and what we do now is we're very much in the business of empowering people to tell their own stories and break them away. One of our clients is the United Nations. The UN came to us about seven or eight years ago, and they were upset because they had stuff in Darfur where they are helping refugees, and the Syrian refugee thing hadn't really started yet, but they had refugees in Mali and you know all this stuff, and they kept begging CNN or the BBC, please come to Darfur to show how terrible all this is. And of course, CNN, they don't want to go. Nobody's watching CNN really gives a crap about Darfur, and all the people who sit there go, well, I could do it for Darfur, or I could do like OJ. Which do I rather, I'd rather do OJ, because that's where the ratings are. Television news is a business. It is not about journalism. It is not about telling the truth. It is not about finding, I'm probably breaking all the things that they did. They threw me out of Columbia Journalism School and NYU Journalism School, because I used to tell the students that what they were learning was crap, but I'm sorry. That's crap. That's probably why they don't let me teach here. But it is crap. These, these institutions are not, in, in the New York Times, they are not interested in telling the truth. Mm -hmm. They're interested in making money. And they make money by putting things on the air that people want to read. Salacious, uh, uh, investigative, I mean, do you ever watch 60 Minutes? I don't do really, it was softball questions and stories that they actually steal from some newspaper somewhere else. And they never really ask anybody any really hard questions because nobody would go on the show. So it's always this kind of bullshit softball stuff. So the fact is that that when with the UN and had all this, I mean, literally millions of people dying in places like Mali because they couldn't get water and they couldn't get out, or civil wars going on in Sudan, people getting slaughtered every day. And the CNN and the BBC and maybe they didn't really want to go. And if they finally dated, they went to Darfur about four years after the shit started. And when they finally go, you know, they send some moron from the bureau who doesn't know anything, doesn't speak Arabic, doesn't know the history, doesn't, all these people who go to Iraq, they don't know what they're talking about, doesn't know the language, doesn't know the history, they fly into some location, there's some fixer, I'll tell you some funny stories about this when I was at the network, some fixer comes and goes, oh, I can help you, we wouldn't meet everyone, you pay the guy, and then, you know, they show up at the crew, and they shoot for like a day or two, and they don't know anything, and who tells them what's going on? The UN person down there. So I said to the UN, we'll empower your people to tell their own stories. You don't need CNN with the internet. You don't need the BBC. So the UN, eh, kind of, eh, okay. So they did one, did one training, and we did it in Geneva, which is where the headquarters are lovely. And the people who work for the UN, they're all very smart. So we, we only work with smart phones. We don't, we don't cameras, no lights, no tripods, none of this crap. Just phones. Everybody's got a phone. And so we put them through this intensive boot camp that we run for everybody. And in four days, we can take anybody from knowing nothing to being absolutely, positively broadcast quality, perfect. But we start the day by saying, you have to forget everything you know or you think you know and just do exactly what I tell you to do. And we still run these boot camps all the time. If you want to sign up for one, 50% discount for in the room. So we can teach anybody in four days to make absolutely, positively perfect television every single time, but not by the rules that... I don't want to denigrate this place because I don't know, but what they used to teach at Columbia and all those places like that because they, the people, they don't know what they're talking about to begin with. So anyway, the UN, the first experiment went very well with the, you know, because it was in Geneva, how hard could it be? So then they said, let's do another one. And so I said, you give me anybody you want. So they gave us this full spectrum of secretaries and reception. Anybody can learn how to do this. 
And in some ways, the secretaries did better stuff because they were very motivated to be successful. So after two sessions, then, you know, we had this, I want to do the whole UN. So we had this big contract on the table, and we had a meeting in Geneva, and I sat at the table with my wife, who's my business partner, who will be here at 6 o'clock. And so I banged the table, and I said, I will go to the most difficult place you have to prove. So they said, okay, go to, go to Somalia. So I went to Lisa, and I said, uh, you're going to Somalia. <laughs> so she, but it turned out Somalia was so dangerous that even the UN didn't want to go there. So we ended up going to Kenya instead, which also turned out to be fairly dangerous. While we were there, the ISIS guys came, or Boko Haram, or whatever they call themselves, I think it's the Ikhwan up there, and they raked one of the buses from the United Nations and killed a bunch of people and grabbed three women from Denmark and took them off to Somalia and held them hostage. So no screwing around, it was still dangerous. But the thing went so well that we've been working with the UN now for the last you know, seven years. I think we've trained about 160 or 170 people. They all shoot with camera, our phones all the time. They make their own stuff everywhere they are. They tell the stories that's actually happening to them. So I'm this great fan of democratizing the medium. And we repeat this trick all the time with regular people, with organizations, with anybody. We're just starting a thing with, with this great guy named Samson Stiles, who we, we, we trained BET. We took BET from having camera crews to working in this way. And at one of the trainings, Samson was sitting next to me. And he's a nice guy. I said, what did you do before this? He says, I was in prison for seven years. I said, you were? He said, you armed robbery. I said, you're kidding. He said, no. He said, but when I got out of prison, somebody gave me a video camera. And I went out and I shot this video. And I took it to BET. And it was so good, they hired me. And now I'm a correspondent here. So now we're working with Samson to do this training, which we're doing for free, for inner city kids to empower them, because they all got phones, to tell their own stories and put the stuff online. Because they all live up in you know, East New York or Holland, and what do they see when they see on TV? Murder, rape, because that's what the, and so their image of their community sucks, and it's not really true, it's a fantasy. And so we say, take control of the medium out of the hands of W Channel 5 and all that kind of stuff. Tell your own story, so I'm an enormous, advocate of telling your own story and that's what we do all the time and so when do, where do these kids put the things that they produce? online it's online we haven't launched it yet we're going to launch a channel for them wow. we're still training them but we will launch a channel for them like the un has a channel with the fact is that with the internet you don't need if you look where the industry is going now the vast majority of the industry has gotten off of cable and they're all going to online whether it's netflix or apple or amazon television dead cable is the broadcast is finished so the fact is that, that the internet is free, anybody can get online. We run, a, we run a course called How to Start Your Own TV Channel, which is very popular, particularly in third world countries, because people want to bypass the whole, it's like when cell phones come to Africa, you know, they bypass the whole twisted cable, cable thing, uh, copper thing, and they go right to this. So we like to design these online channels, but we're really about giving people their own voices. This is the democratization of the medium, and it's critically important. The same thing happened in the world of print, but 500 years ago. Before the invention of the printing press, every book was written by monks by hand. It was very expensive, very hard to do, took a year, very beautiful things, but really expensive to do. And you had to be a monk to be able to write. And so every book, they all have one book, they all have the Bible. That's the only book they had. But to write the book, you had to have permission of the church and the king and all this kind of stuff. And actually 500 years ago, um, this month, ironically, nobody celebrates this, Martin Luther, uh, one of these monks, was annoyed with the Pope. And so he goes to the Cathedral of Wittenberg and he posts the 95 Thesis on the door of the cathedral, but he did something else. He published this new piece of technology called the printing press, which had been in Mainz for about 50 years. He publishes books and he publishes pamphlets. And suddenly Europe is flooded with his crazy ideas that selling indulgence is a bad idea and the Pope is kind of a jerk. And all across Europe, people are reading these things. They go, whoa, the guy's right, the guy's right. So this revolution comes on that turns Europe upside down, not because of his ideas, but because he married his ideas to the new technology and got them out. And he essentially bypassed the control of the church and the king and all that kind of stuff and changed the world. The United States Constitution, which you're probably familiar with, is, is a product of that Gutenberg Martin Luther revolution. It's printed word. Before the Constitution, governments were based on the word of the king. After the Constitution, after the, when the Constitution comes along, the, the basis of this country is the written word. And everybody says, I mean, even the Second Amendment, or whatever it's worth, they go, this is what our rights are. It's written out right here. I can read it. This is a printed, reproduced document, a function of the printing press. And that's why the First Amendment in the Constitution says, it doesn't say you have the right to vote. It doesn't say you don't have the taxation. The very First Amendment says 
Congress shall make no law abridging a free press. That's why you're all here. That's what this is all about, right? Freedom of the press. We no longer will live in a world of a print press. We live in a world of video, for better or for worse. The average American watches five hours of television a day, every day. It's an idiot country, that's why Donald Trump is the president, but that's the country that we have. It is the most powerful medium in the world. And up until now, that medium has been and is controlled by a handful of major corporations whose only interest is in a profit. That's all they're interested in. This smartphone is the Gutenberg's printing press of the 21st century. It makes it possible for anyone with an idea to publish whatever their idea is. It doesn't make any difference without needing the permission of CNN or NBC or ABC or the New York Times, essentially the king and the monarchy and the papacy of the 21st century. That's why this is a phenomenal revolution. So you're talking about what the future of the medium is. The future of the medium is going to be shattering the old world. The notion of network control, I have to work for CBS, I have an executive producer, fuck them, you don't need them. You have the right, you have the privilege, you have the right, and in fact as journalists, that's what you're doing here, you have the responsibility to embrace the technology and tell your story or someone else's story. I'm a big fan of giving these cameras and teaching people, underprivileged people, people who don't have a voice, give them an opportunity to express what they want without having to go through the filter of some executive producer at ABC or CBS or NBC or stuff like that. And that, to me, is the future of the industry. I brought some samples of some shows that we've done, and we've actually sold, distributed worldwide, done it entirely this way. No cameraman, no sound man, no producer, no nothing. We just give cameras to people with an idea, we teach them how to do this, and then we unleash them and let them fly. But let me show you one other thing before we... Are you interested in this? Is this going someplace? Oh okay. So let me, let me just get this whiteboard over here. Can I drag this around? Yeah. yeah. I want to show you something very interesting about the, the nature of the Oops, I don't think it's going to fit through here. Okay. Okay, so let me show you something really interesting. I think we'll get this right away. I don't know, I got to use that. You don't need large play. Oh, you got it. Okay. When a new piece of technology comes along, really changes the world. This is called creative destruction. Did you ever hear this phrase before? Uh, Joseph Schumpeter, a 1950s, uh, that's fine. Joseph Schumpeter, a 1950s um, economist, Hungarian-American, term, coined the term creative destruction. It means new technologies come along and by their very dint, the new technology destroys entire industries. For example, when the car comes along, the horse and buggy industry is dead. How do you call it? Creative destruction, right? Um, I always tell the story about the ice. The ice business was once a fantastic business. People had ice farms and ice houses and they shipped ice as far as India and if you were in the ice business in the 19th century, you made a fortune. In, in 1927, uh, Westinghouse developed refrigeration and the day they developed refrigeration, the ice business is finished. It's over. So all these creative destructions come along and each technology destroys an entire industry. There's an old expression you probably heard that says, necessity is the mother of invention. Did you ever hear that? It's total bullshit. Because no newspaper in the world ever went, we need the internet. Believe me, every newspaper wishes that thing never existed. What happens is technologies come along and they just wreck everything and then things get reinvented. So here's what's happening now with these little cameras. And if you want to get into the industry, this is something you should be aware of. Up until now, the, the nature of journalism and public discourse and newspapers and everything else has been basically this model. We make it and you watch it. You read it, you listen to it, whether it's TV, radio, newspapers, doesn't matter. You come and work for us up here, right? We pay you to make the stuff, then we distribute it, whether we do it in paper or television, and then the public watches it down here, and then we rent out little slots of this for advertising, and that's, that's the business model, right? And it's always been that way. And that's how the New York Times is, that's how CNN is, that's how ABC is, that's how pretty much everybody works. When the internet came along, these industries took this model and jammed it into the web. So if you go to newyorktimes.com on the internet, you essentially see a newspaper, right? Washington Post, you see a newspaper. It's the same thing. We make it, you watch it. 
But if you look at every single successful business that's a pure child of the internet, as opposed to a, 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 an adoption, they work in a very different way. Let's look at eBay. How does eBay work? eBay has this big silo at the top where eBay says, you put all the crap in here that you want to. It doesn't make any difference. You know, old roller skates, pictures, old radios, I don't care what it is. You just jam it. We have no, there's no executive producer of eBay. You just put all the stuff in here that you want. Down here, here's all the people who use eBay. And what eBay does is it connects people like this all day long, right? That's why this company is worth $30 billion, right? Nobody works for eBay. It just goes on by itself. Uber, everybody with a car up here, everybody wants to use a car down here. J date, right? Every Jewish girl who can't get a date up here, every guy down here. Um, uh, uh, Airbnb. Everybody with an empty, you see, it's the same model over and over again. It's interesting, right? It's the same model over and over and over again. And the funny thing is that Airbnb, no hotel rooms, right? Uber, no taxis, right? Uh, uh, TripAdvisor, no professional writers running around doing stuff, right? Facebook, everybody's on Facebook, right? Right, you all work for Facebook. Did you ever get a check from Mark Zuckerberg? No, because you're morons, right? Instagram, right? Who puts stuff in Instagram? Everybody puts stuff in Instagram? You ever get a check from Instagram? No, you're an idiot, right? <laughs> all the content comes like this. It just comes in here, and then all people want to use it here, and Facebook, Instagram, they all place themselves here. This is the model for the future. This is the model, this, well, three and a half billion people with smartphones making video and stuff. They dump all the news up here. Here's a guy in Darfur who's got a story. Here's somebody in Connecticut who's got a story. Here's somebody who's got a story. It doesn't make any difference. You, if you ever had an executive producer of eBay, the thing would fall apart. What do you do for a living? I'm the executive. I don't think we should have GI Joe. No, we don't want that. Old radios, no, we'll put them over here. That would be crazy. You understand it works because it's an open platform. There's no executive producer from Facebook, which has turned out to be problematic in some ways, but you know what? A free press is messy, so it's messy, so what? So, in the journalism, someone will come along in the journalism business and go, I need the New York Times, which is what I'm telling you. You don't need the, you don't need the Washington Post. You don't need any of these things. All you need is something. Everybody puts something. It doesn't make any difference. And down here, all the people who want to see it. I want this. I want this. I want this. See how the model works? So this is what is going to happen. It's going to happen not because I said it's a good idea. It's going to happen because the technology has a DNA of its own, and it will ultimately sink down to this. The problem with the journalism business is the people who run it are so terrified, they're so conservative, they're such morons in some ways, that even when I've explained this to presidents of networks, which I've done, they'll go, yeah, 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 that's going to happen, but not yet, right? So, Because they don't want to do it. They don't want to go through the, the trauma. And also, when you go, believe me, when you go to networks and you go tell people that, you know, Matt Lauer, we don't really need you anymore for your $30 million a year to go read what somebody else wrote, they go, get the fuck out of the building. They do not even let that guy in here. But this is what is going to happen. So what we've tried to do in our own little way, in our little company, is we are very much in the power, I can't build this. I don't have the money and I can't raise, I've tried to do this, but believe me, the resistance is mind-boggling. But eventually, you know, somebody like Mark Zuckerberg will come along and make one of these things. It's going to happen. So what we do in our way is our end of the stick here is that we like to empower people and urge them to put stuff in here. And if you come by at 6 o'clock, I will explain to you how to sell this product. Iron it's so ironic because if you can make the product this way, um, this, which is the model for obviously broadcasting cable, these people are so desperate for content that if the stuff is good, they will actually pay you. Do you all watch TV shows, right? You watch like HGTV or stuff like that, right? House Hunters, you like that show, right? You know what they pay per episode of that? It's only a half hour. $350,000 per episode to the production company. Really? Isn't that shocking? Yeah. Don't you think you could make something like that? Easily. Easily, with a phone. Well, with your boot camp. With my boot camp, definitely. Because okay. that's what we teach you to do. We don't teach you to make news because no money in news, much as I like it. But the real money is in sports, uh, travel, food. I mean, look at what's on cable, you know? And these people pay $150,000 to $350,000 per half hour for a show. It won't last. I mean, this is not going to go on forever. But in the meantime, if you can take your phone and you can go make some dumb show, do you watch HGTV? Not in a while, but yes. Yeah, but every show is exactly the same, right? It doesn't make any difference. Same couple. It's six comfort thousand. for it. It's comfort, right? So you go to HGTV with another stupid show like that, and if it fits their mind, it's like McDonald's. You don't go to McDonald's and go, you know what, guys? Foie gras, really fantastic. They're not doing it. But you go to HGTV, you go, hey, I got this great thing. This couple, they buy houses, they replant, they go, whoa, let's see it. If it's any good, they'll go, 
I can tell you a funny story. <laughs> um, many, many years ago, many years ago, um, when I was teaching at Columbia, I was dating one of my students, a big mistake. <laughs> I married her, which is an even bigger mistake. I got divorced after that, it was, it was fine. <laughs> nasty, she had a nasty piece of work. Anyway, um, um, when I was dating her, uh, it was a long time ago, she wanted to be a documentary filmmaker. Well, you know what it's like. I mean, you know, it's, uh, sure, I'll teach you how to make documentary films. So we went to, we took the cameras, and we went to this hospital in Philadelphia, uh, Hospital University of Pennsylvania. And we went into the emergency room. And we're sitting there in the emergency room, and then this guy sits down across from us, and we got the little ca cameras. And so the guy said, and you got to do something. So, you know, I want to impress her anyway. So I turned to the guy, I said, what are you here for? He said, I was shot six times. I said, you were? He goes, yeah, you want to see it? Okay. So he pulls up his shirt, and he's got like six, you know, in the movies, they, people die. But in real life, you know, the bullet goes in, it cauterizes itself, and it works itself out like a splinter, and you see it coming out. So then the girl goes, I was shot in the butt. You want to see that? I go, no, no, that's right. <laughs> so they take the guy inside, and the doctors, uh, you'll understand this, Dr. Kaplan, they hate these people. They call them frequent flyers. So this woman, the resident, she starts pulling the bullets out without anesthetic. The guy just holds on, and the guy's screaming, you know, ah! and, and he goes, and she's pulling him out, and she goes, doesn't that feel better? He goes, that do not feel better. <laughs> the guy is screaming, and he pulls the bullet out. He's got the bullet in the forceps like this, and I have the camera, I'm shooting the thing, and the girlfriend reaches out, and she grabs the bullet out of the thing, and she goes, you said you were shot with a 38. This ain't no 38, this is a Glock 9 millimeter. So I thought, this is pretty good stuff. So, so we went home, and um, my ex-wife, who was much younger than I was, and much hipper in many ways, because I had come from PBS, and I said, well, we're gonna make this documentary about you know the, the, the medical knowledge of the Vietnam War comes to the war zone of the inner city in Philadelphia. And she said to me, that sucks. And I go, what do you mean? I said, what do you want to do? She said, I want to do really fast cuts and put rock music on it. I said, are you out of your mind? This is life and death, we can't do that. And so we had this meeting with the Learning Channel. Learning Channel had just started. It was really an educational channel, the Learning Channel. And so, um, so we had this meeting, and we're going to show them this like three-minute pitch reel that we made, which we'll talk about also at the thing downstairs, how to do this. So, you know, I had this big fight with her, and so finally I said, all right, you know what, you go fuck the thing up, you'll see, it's going to be terrible, go ahead, cut it the way you want it, you know, she was a kid. And so, and I was an asshole. So, um, so um, she cuts this thing together with this rock music, and it's like, dun, 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 dun. don't cut off my leg! Dun, 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 dun. My baby's gonna die! Dun, 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 dun. Whoa. Whoa. So we get a meeting at the Learning Channel, which is in Bethesda, and we go into this room like this, and we're sitting around with all these executives from the Learning Channel, Discovery, I just bought it, still an educational channel, and they did stuff like, the Romans were a happy people, you know? And so John Ford, who runs the thing, he goes, let's see what you got. So I throw the tape in the deck, and we put a thing up, and it's like, dun, 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 dun. Ah, ah, don't cut off my leg. Your baby's going to die. And you see all the people sitting in the room, and they're like, <laughs> and I look at her and go, oh, we're going to get thrown out of here in two seconds. So the thing is over, and then Ford turns to me and says, I want to order 13 half hours immediately, $200,000 per half hour. So I thought, oh, that's pretty good. So I mean, essentially $2.6 million slid across the table in that moment. And I went, okay. So we walked out, and I turned to her. I said, well, that was pretty good. And she says, you don't know what the fuck you're doing. You stay out of the edit rooms. I'll take care of this. So me, I should have got divorced right then. I knew this was going to be a mistake. But anyway, this became a series called Trauma Life in the ER, which still is on television to this day. Real life emergency rooms. I mean, it's so demented. It's so awful. It's making money out of people's service. But it's a business. So anyway, that's how we got into the business of producing you know, shows that cable wants. So my advice to people, we'll talk about this downstairs, if you want to make real money, which maybe you want to do, you have a machine in your house that is giving you minute-to-minute -minute updates on what the cable industry wants, your TV set. Just turn it on and just give them more of what they want, which is fine, but it doesn't solve my passion in life, which is to empower people to tell their own stories and not produce crap. So it's kind of a dichotomy. Anyway, in the other side, since we also want to be commercial, we got this idea to make commercial programming that was based on this model, to get rid of all the intermediaries, producers and cameramen and sound men and directors and all that kind of stuff. So I had a nephew who was going to Wash U in, in, uh, in St. Louis, and he had 
three friends that he got, graduated from WashU, and they were work, working as investment bankers. I don't know how a 23-year-old who comes out of college and doesn't know a thing becomes an investment banker. That's another story. Mm -hmm. Anyway, these guys, they're very sweet, but they, when I met them, they were the biggest geeks in the world. You know what I mean? They grew up in New Jersey, and you know, they, they never, they didn't, they didn't, they didn't, they didn't but they, did you ever hear this thing called the Mongo Rally? So you drive this beat up old cars to the race that goes from London to Ulaanbaatar in the middle of Mongolia. And they, I didn't even have driver's licenses, I don't think. And you know, they'd been to like Disney World. That was probably the extent of their travel. And so they want to do the Mongo rally. So I said, okay, you know, I, I'll pay for it. I'll get you the car and I'm going to give you cameras, but I'm going to put you through the boot camp and teach you how to shoot your own stuff. So they actually went to London and they did the thing and they shot and they shot like animals. They're fantastic filmmakers. You can see them now online. They're called the Nowhere Men because after this experience, they couldn't go back to investment banks, and now they make their own films. You should check out their stuff. But um, essentially, they, um, they um, made fantastic, I'm gonna show you some of the stuff that they made. It's absolutely uh, fantastic material, and they did it all themselves. Now, what makes this really interesting to me is first, the cost is obviously next to nothing. I mean, if we had sent a camera crew to go and follow them you know, around the world and stuff like that, uh, the thing would have cost a, a bloody fortune. But because it was by themselves, they could take as long as they wanted, and these guys were animals, and they shot absolutely beautiful, perfect stuff every day, and they actually did, we turned it into a 13-part series, which I will show you, but I'm going to have to stop streaming because the rights is attached to this, and we don't want to show it to the general public before somebody buys it. However, you can see it over here, and if you sign up for the boot camps, you can see it at home, but not right now. So, but at any rate, they made fantastic stuff, and it was so good, and it was so great that we sent them the next time when they came back, and of course, they'd gone through this complete life metamorphosis, you know? Mm -hmm. And so when we came back, we sent them, we put them in cars, they bought a car in New York, and they drove it all the way to Ushuaia in the southern tip of Chile, uh, which took them a year and a half, but also made this fantastic series. Now, what makes it interesting to me is, first, it's authorship. If you go with a crew, the producer, they tell you, I mean, most of these reality shows are all fake because they're all directed and produced and stuff like that. But if you write a novel, you know, you sit down and you write the novel, and it's your heart going onto the paper, whether it's good, bad, or indifferent. So this was a sort of a macro shift in how what television means, because it was no longer making a film about what somebody else does. It was a personal statement like writing a book or a novel. So the stuff is fantastic to me just from that perspective alone. Second, it democratized the medium because it allowed them to tell their own story in their own way without somebody interjecting and saying, here's what you have to do, you have to do this kind of stuff. And third, these guys now, you know, they have a pretty good business. I think their last video, they got 12 or 13 million views on, uh, on Facebook. So, I mean, they're really, they, and they live in Brooklyn and they make films and, you know, God bless them, they should go on forever. So we've done that with a bunch of people and I'm gonna show you some samples, but before I show you the samples, we're gonna stop live streaming. So I hope you enjoyed that and I hope you will sign up for the uh, um, next bootcamp, which is gonna be on our site, thevj.com. Bye.